Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the JN Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Restucia, Vice President of Water Management Solutions for JN Irrigation. And today we're going to be talking about a super important subject. And the reason why I say it is uh, super important is that, uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm a tree lover. And uh, the other reason why is trees certainly uh, almost on all landscapes turn out to be your most valuable uh, asset. Right. If you've got a 20 year old or 50 year old tree sitting on your property, if you ever had to replace that and replace it with what, what was there, uh, you know, we're talking uh, thousands and thousands of dollars. In most cases, it's not even possible. So you've got a combination of expense for a new tree plus uh, time. And that's why they're so valuable. And then uh, most importantly, from an aesthetic uh, perception, uh, trees really, I think, uh, oftentimes make uh, properties what they are. So now we have uh, beautiful trees on properties. We've got a lot of people doing turf conversions now. Rip out the turf. You know, this is a this is the calling card of uh, a lot of uh, uh, urban areas. And uh, uh, what we're finding is that when they're pulling out the turf, uh, they're also hurting the trees. And, and man, we don't want that, right? We want to keep those trees healthy and looking good. So to take us through our subject in our session today is uh, Andy Bellingeri, the National Sales Manager for Jane Irrigation. But if you guys have seen Andy before, you know that he is also a tree lover. Uh, Andy uh, received his uh, degree in horticulture from uh, BYU uh, a few years ago, many years ago now. Sorry, Andy. Uh, it, I know it went by in a blink of an eye, but uh, BYU grad went to work for Valley Crest Landscaping, uh, worked as an account manager, ran crews in the field, worked his way up to uh, a business developer job, uh, and then moved through the industry and then uh, uh, came to Jane about seven years ago, uh, about the same time I arrived. So uh, we uh, a couple of things I like about Andy is um, he has more than just a general interest in horticulture and trees. It's, he's really passionate about it. You saw him uh, in the springtime, he did a thing on the roses around his house and how to, how to get a good spring startup. And he really uh, lives and breathes horticulture, gardening, landscaping, really enjoys it. And I think he brings that enjoyment to a lot of people who, uh, who he talks to. So we're fortunate to have him here today. So Andy, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I'm always happy to be here, always. Always so, Andy, you're talking yes, about a tree turf. lover, a tree hugger. <laughs> a, tree hugger, a couple of tree huggers today. So, Andy, um, we're talking about turf conversions. And, uh, you know, this was uh, really big news a few years ago. Uh, I think a lot of people recognize that. And I'm just wondering today, are there still a lot of people doing turf conversions or has all the turf been converted? No, there are still people doing them. Um, this particular picture is about four years old, but yeah, there are still people doing them. And I think more are going to happen. Vegas has uh, banned, this has made national news, uh, uh, what they call ineffective uh, turf. If, if, you know, if the only time you step on it is to mow it, then you need to get rid of it. Um, so decorative turf, ornamental lawns um, have been banned. I think the date is 2025. Five, I think to, to have those removed. Uh, the good news is the Southern Nevada Water Authority is still offering cash for grass, you know, three to five dollars a square foot to rip out um, your turf and, and install a, um, a, a water wise or desert friendly landscape. Yeah. All right. Well, you're making me crazy here. So um, <laughs> number one. <laughs> um, so it's interesting that they are uh, uh, offering so much money, right? And I always think, you know, uh, there's uh, uh, good places that we could uh, we could spend this money, and uh, two other places, and then two, you know, I think the distinguishing factor before was you couldn't plant new turf. That was a few years ago, right? Southern Nevada uh, Water Authority said that, mm -hmm. and now this new one is if you have it, you got to take it out, right? Correct. And so what makes me crazy about this is it's really a prescriptive solution instead of a uh, performance base, instead of just saying, gee, here's your allotment of water. If you can stay at this allotment or under, you're doing great. If you're over, we're going to charge you, right? So uh, I, I, you know, I hope Southern Nevada Water Authority gets what they want out of that. But uh, uh, I, I am, I'm always challenged with these uh, prescriptive uh, regulations. So anyway, um, so a lot of people are doing it. Uh, I'm just thinking, wouldn't it be easier, Andy, to just put in a smart controller? Yeah, um, 
yeah, with the prescriptive, I agree with you, Richard, on that prescriptive solution, uh, you know, solutions that my inner libertarian says, no, give me the freedom to do what I want here um, with, with whatever I'm allotted, right? But, you know, that, that's not the case. We, we, we deal with what we have. Uh, speaking of the smart controllers, um, I, I think smart controllers are an absolute uh, a beautiful solution. Um, what, what we've learned in water conservation, I think there is no silver bullet. It's not like if I do this one thing and then I've solved the problem, it really is a, uh, it's a combination of efforts by switching from drip to spray, right? I can significantly um, decrease the amount of water I use by increasing efficiency, by uh, removing high water use plant material to low water use plant material. In the case of turf conversion, I can further reduce my, my water need. Uh, by using a smart controller, regardless of the landscape I have, regardless of the, the, the irrigation delivery system I have, I can further optimize the efficiency of my, my delivery system. So um, it really is a, a, an all of the above, a little of this, a little of that. Uh, smart controllers are the intelligent approach um, that helps tie this all together effectively. But um, specifically, yeah, we do see with this with drought, I think we're going to see uh, more and more uh, of a push to, to remove high water use material. So, um, you know, hence, hence the topic today, but, uh, yeah, um, with, with the, with the drought, um, whether it's a smart controller, removing turf, switching from spray to drip, uh, or maybe from a low efficiency spray to a, to maybe a more high, high efficiency no nozzle or rotor, um, more needs to be done. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's a great point, Andy. And I like that. And, and I agree, right? It's not a, a one size fits all. <laughs> we don't have those solutions. And uh, in order to do what we need to do uh, moving forward to, uh, to, to help the industry, and uh, uh, we really need, we'll, we'll really need to try multiple solutions. Multiple. You know, and last time I was on with you, Richard, we talked about five steps that anybody could take to reduce water um, consumption. Uh, if you'll remember, there was uh, step one was reduce plant water demand. And there was, there was, you know, different ways to do that. But I've highlighted, you know, in site design, replacing turf with low water use shrubs or removing the stupid strips. Um, and I wish I would have been the person that came up with that saying, but I love it, you know, that, that stupid strip. Uh, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll see more and more of that. And we see, you know, water authorities incentivizing people to get rid of turf, um, especially turf that's, that's uh, um, like I said earlier, if you only step on it to mow it, it probably, it, it, maybe you should rethink its application or if it's uh, the, these narrow um, um, corridors where it becomes hard to irrigate, you probably should remove it. So uh, focusing in on, of the five we talked about last week, getting specific on, on turf. Um, and you see this, here's a, here's a couple ads from SNWA, you know, get paid for useless grass, right? Trade your, your grass for cash. Um, in, the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, SNWA was giving out t-shirts that said, I lost my grass in Vegas. And that was uh, kind of a fun little market. Their, their marketing is great. Go out to their website. Their videos are great. Um, some some really <laughs> clever, creative. Yeah, just um, just in time for Father's Day. A good dad joke. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but their 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 marketing has been has been uh, has been creative. So they they have those incentives. And you know, in essence, uh, you can have a water wise landscape. Um, no grass that, that reduces your water usage by half or in some instances by 75% and still looks beautiful and sometimes really enhances the beauty and the diversity and the, the aesthetics of your landscape. Yeah, a couple that's, things. That's the goal. A couple things, Andy. Uh, you mentioned that you did uh, five things you can do to reduce water use on your property. Was that, was that the correct title of it? Yeah, five steps you can take to reduce. To, to so save water now, something like Remind that. everybody after they can still watch that, right? At changeusa.com forward slash trainings. You can find that training there. Uh, I also want to remind everybody that we've got the QA and the chat open. So if you've got questions for Andy as we go along, put them in there and uh, we'll get them answered uh, best we could. 
And then uh, finally, uh, who did coin that phrase, stupid strips? I thought it was you. I just wanted to be sure you remembered. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I yeah, see, removing grass, these turf conversions in Vegas, man, this started at least 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago. Um, and having spent a lot of years as a contractor, getting rid of stupid strips and, and getting rid of turf, learn some lessons along the way. And these are lessons that as, as other people begin to go down this road, I, I hope to share an important lesson uh, today. Uh, here you see a tree on the left, happens to be a mulberry, happily growing in turf. And then you see a tree on the right. Now this is an ash tree. I, I, I did not have a before and after, but this ash tree on the right used to be growing in turf. And now it's, it's growing in, it, it's gone through a turf conversion and it doesn't look too happy. And we experienced this in Vegas. We're doing all these turf conversions and all these beautiful, these old, I, mean, I, I mentioned earlier at the top of the podcast, Old Henderson, when I was a kid, every street was lined with these huge mulberry and elm shade trees. Now these weren't uh, the American elm, these were the Chinese elm. So they didn't die because of Dutch elm disease. They died because, hey, I get some money to get rid of my grass, I'm gonna save water. Well, then the trees died. And uh, that's not what we want. So we'll talk about how to keep prevent that from happening in today's webinar. But you know, it's Andy, important do they, to remember. But do they ahead. die because the contractor or homeowner does something wrong during the conversion, or do they die because they don't get enough water after that they didn't add, you know, an extra valve or the right emitters to get it enough water? Uh, so yeah, both actually. Um, and we'll talk about those. It, it's a one, two punch. Uh, there, there's two major culprits and it, it is, there's, there's some, some practices that are, that are, uh, happening to damage the tree. And then it follows up with not enough water. Um, you know, occasionally there can be maybe a blight or something, but, but, not, but even then, if you're having insect or disease damage, um, drought or mechanical damage to the tree is going to create the opening for uh, disease or pests to come in. Um, and, and shade trees, Richard, you grew up in Arizona. Anybody, and even, it doesn't matter what climate you live in, I think in the middle of the summer, everybody knows the value of a shade tree. Nothing is better than sitting in the shade of a nice shade tree. Um, it, it's, it's not only cooler because you're in the shade, but there's the evaporative cooling effect as well. It significantly reduces the temperature. Uh, like this house here, can you imagine on a, uh, on, on a hot summer day, if, if that's your living room, your front room, front of your house is covered by that shade tree, your air conditioning bill is going to be significantly reduced because uh, it's cooler there. You don't have the, the energy that's, that's pounding on that house. You don't have to run your AC as much. Uh, it certainly adds beauty. Uh, a, mature, a mature shade tree is uh, tree-lined streets, right? That's a classic Americana as we like to see. Uh, creates nest uh, for, for wildlife. Uh, I have a, uh, a Chinese elm, which this tree happens to be as well, but I've got a, a lace bark Chinese elm in my uh, front yard and, and uh, I, I've got the, the quail that is next door in the desert have decided to roost up in that. And every, uh, every evening I hear them fluttering in and I can hear them clucking around up in the tree. Um, one of the biggest things though, I think the value of trees we talk about carbon and, and you know, um, carbon offsets and so forth, but trees are probably the number one best way to sequester carbon. We need to plant more trees and we could sequester quite a bit more carbon. So there's that environmental benefit. And not to mention the value, the single largest valuable piece of your landscape are the trees. Um, $10,000, $20,000 easy uh, in replacement value. Man, if I wanted to plant a, a mature, uh, Phoenix dactylifera uh, uh, date palm uh, tree in, um, or, or a, uh, uh, one of the Canary Island date palms. I mean, that, that could run, you know, ten fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 by the time you do the crane and everything. Those, those, these large mature trees get expensive. We need to protect them. They sure do, and, uh, and we sure do. The other thing I noticed too, Andy, is from a uh, real estate value, a property value, whether it's uh, HOA, individual residence, um, nice commercial property, depending on the, the trees can change the atmosphere and uh, definitely change the uh, value of the property as well. Yeah, it feels cooler 
I think psychologically the greenery you know, green's a cool color. And I think I think uh, physically it is cooler as well, and it, it does add value. So uh, the two critical keys to remember in protecting trees in a in a turf to zero escape conversion is uh, roots and water. Right, number one, tree roots. We have to know where they are, and we have to protect them. And then the water requirements, we need to know how much water the, the tree needs, how frequently it needs the water, but most importantly, where that water goes, right? And those are, those are, these are the two keys we'll focus on today. The first, uh, first being roots. I've got this diagram on the left. Uh, I remember in elementary school being taught, hey, you know, these trees, they have roots that grow to China. They have these deep tap roots that just run. I mean, it's, it's, it's going all the way down to China. And then I once I heard somebody say, well, your, your root system is just a reflection of the canopy up top. And that's what this picture on the left represents. Now, that may be the case in a tree in nature. That may be a case in some random variety. But in the landscape, nursery grown plant material that's grown in the landscape, specifically in turf, this, this diagram on the right is what we see. We see a very shallow root system that spreads out four, five, six, times beyond the canopy, the, the drip canopy, where the, the, the leaves are and the branches are. So you see shallow and wide. And that's important to understand as we're doing a turf to zero scape conversion. Oh, I love that uh, picture, Andy, that sketch. Uh, that is enlightening. I think, you know, we have uh, liquid ambers in California and they grow shallow roots. You can see them up, you know, on top of the ground, on top of the soil uh, all the time. And, and you see that better, but this is a, you don't see this type of uh, illustration often. And uh, that really yeah, helps everybody understand better what you have to do in order to, to do one of these conversions. Now, one of our uh, viewers is asking, uh, can you can, most of these have been uh, irrigated with uh, sprinkler systems, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with spray heads. And uh, can you convert that spray head to a drip system? Absolutely. We'll cover how to do it. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so these next three pictures, though, if you like this diagram on the right, these next three pictures, you're really going to like. Uh, this is this is taken out in uh, Lake Las Vegas in Henderson, uh, a newer community. This is about Oh, five or six years ago, they were building a retaining wall. And I thought, oh, what a great opportunity to understand the soil profile of these large, mature uh, uh, pine trees. And if we zoom in a little bit, you can see the tree roots there. You can see the grass and you can see the tree roots. And you get, you, you get deeper than about four inches, five inches, there are no tree roots. All of those tree roots are growing in the top three, four, five inches of the soil. Um, the feeder roots even more shallow, top couple inches. Why are they growing there? Well, that's where the water has been the tree's entire life. When you irrigate, irrigate grass, spray uh, uh, irrigation, typically it's shallow. And so, you know, we end up with not just shallow rooted turf, Tur turf roots can grow 12 inches deep, but you end up with this uh, shallow rooted turf because of shallow irrigation. We also end up with shallow rooted trees because of shallow irrigation. And, uh, you know, that, that causes a lot of problems. High winds, these trees can topple over. But more importantly, when I, when I come to do a turf conversion, 99 out of 100, maybe, maybe less, hopefully less now, maybe it's 80, 80% 80 of contractors to get rid of this turf, they're coming in with either a sod cutter or a skid steer and they're scooping up the turf. Here's a picture, uh, this is St. Rose Dominican Hospital again. This is uh, in 2017. You can see that they came in with uh, both sod cutters and a skid steer and were ripping up the grass. And that's probably two inches deep, right? And again, we think, okay, the roots are in the top three to four inches and they're taking two inches off. Well, what are the chances that roots came up with it? Well. You can see yeah. right here, these are the rolls of sod that came off from the sod cutter. There, there's the roots. There's the majority of the feeder roots are right in there. Um, now, and I didn't include the other picture, but there, another picture I had, there's some of the anchor roots. The larger anchor roots were just like uh, sliced right across the top by these, these uh, uh, sod cutters and, and skid steers. And damaging the roots like that uh, certainly impacts the tree. 
So, and, and when that happens, when those feeder roots are gone all of a sudden, um, you know, how is a tree going to uptake water? If, if, if you're adding water back in originally, you know, it, it, it puts a tremendous amount of stress on the tree. So cutting out all the grass and, and the tree roots, effectively when you, when you remove the grass, you remove the tree roots, um, you, you put the tree under a great amount of stress. And so lesson number one in protecting trees and tur turf conversion is protect the root zone. Um, I recommend not using sod cutters or heavy machinery in that root zone. I know some do it, but there's a better way. I think even a more cost effective way when it comes to uh, having to haul off debris. And that's by using a selective herbicide to kill the grass. Or if, if, if you're opposed to that, you could put down a mulch. You could put down a cardboard mulch. I've heard people doing to kill the grass that way. But in, in a commercial landscape environment, a selective herbicide um, sprayed to the grass to kill it and following that up with scalping it with a lawn mower or even a thatcher to remove that as, uh, as low as you can is much better. And then number two, you want to keep that root removal at a minimum. You come back and think, okay, I got it. I've got to now add irrigation. If you come in with a trencher and you trench cl too close to the tree and you cut off some major buttress roots that tree could topple over or too far out you're, you're again you're cutting roots you're doing damage so you want to um, set up a protection zone under the canopy where you're not doing any any trenching um, if needed you can tunnel under the roots hmm. uh, or you know that's going to be what's best for the tree potentially you could go over the root as well and cover it with mulch so uh don't use every machinery and keep root removal at, at, at a minimum. In essence, it, it, they're, they're both the same thing, and that's protect the roots. Let's not destroy them. Yeah, Andy, a couple things come to mind here. We've got a couple questions, and uh, and the first one is, boy, uh, the odds are really against you. I mean, it's almost like anything you do in in the soil, especially when the roots are so shallow, you, know, you you've got a problem. Yeah. Uh, and two. Uh, and this is a question from one of our viewers, and that is, uh, once you start irrigating properly or after you get the turf out of there, is there any hope that the roots will turn back down? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mentioned earlier, there's, there's a, uh, there, there's a one-two punch. Um, you know, the first was removing the roots. Second was lack of proper irrigation. So, uh, critical to have proper irrigation. And that's, and that's uh, you know, a nice segue into the next section here. So here, here's a picture. This happens to be a, uh, a purple leaf plum happily growing in turf. Well, that, that turf is useless. You're not having a picnic on that. It's just decorative. And you can see the water stains on the sidewalk from all that runoff. I mean, that's just a terrible way. So let's remove that turf and put Xeriscape in. Uh-oh, I've got a dead tree. <laughs> um, and when we look at why did that tree die, right? So let's get into the water. Why did that tree die? What was going on? Well, again, go back. We go back to our, our our diagram. Those tree roots are run out, right? Especially in the uh, in turf, shallow, fibrous root zone. Um, if that root zone was protected, you still have to irrigate it. But what happens is on this tree in particular. Well, if I just put four emitters right next to the trunk, that's going to take care of uh, all the. That's four four square feet of root zone is being watered. There was probably 150 square feet before, and now I'm down to four. And it's no wonder the tree dies. It just, it can't keep up. So what we want to do, we see this illustrated in the next picture. This was uh, another picture uh, taken from a, a turf to zero escape conversion. You can't tell how big it is. The scale's a little funny. I've tried to outline it with uh, those yellow lines, but this is 150 square feet of the tree's root zone which was approximately 70% is being irrigated and it's being irrigated with an inline emitter line, uh, very similar to our, our Jane Total CV. So that that entire root zone is now getting wet. It in essence is mimicking what the spray irrigation was doing, but doing it with drip. And you can see that, that, darkened, that darkened area there where it's being um, uh, water in this, this tree is it continued to grow. It thrived post conversion and continued to grow after. Andy, we've got a great, uh, we've got a question, another question coming in from one of the viewers. And the question is this, 
how do I determine, how can I figure out where my root zone is, right? Do I just dig a bunch of holes? Do I use a probe? How, how do I do this? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna go back a couple slides and go back to a diagram here, I apologize. So let's look at this diagram here. Um, you can see this line on the right. If you follow that line right down there, that's, that's called the drip line, that's the canopy. And this is going to depend on tree species. Um, typically your root zone is going to be between one and a half to two times beyond your canopy. Up, maybe up to four times beyond your canopy is where your roots are gonna be. Your feeder roots especially are gonna be on the outside edge of that. So uh, you could consult with an arborist, you could consult with your cooperative extension, you could even you know, reference books, uh, online, figure out what kind of tree you have, what that root zone is going to be like. And then the key number is irrigate 70% of that root zone. Um, you know, it, it really is species dependent. Uh, so, you know, with, with pine trees, uh, at least the ones out here, these Mondell pines, roots don't quite extend as far. And if, if you've got, uh, you know, one and a half times beyond the drip line, you irrigate that, you're going to be fine. We've seen that with ash trees as well. Um, so that's that's the that's the simplest answer. Uh, without you know, every situation is going to be a little bit um, more unique. But it's fair to say now tree roots are very advantageous. If you have a, a hundred square foot patch of grass and you have a tree growing right in the middle, and beyond that, let's say you don't have anything growing at all, there's no water. Your tree roots are going to be where the grass is. The tree roots are going to be where the water is. Uh, tree roots won't grow through dry soil. Uh, to get to wet. So if, if you say, hey, I've got this area it was where the grass is, that's where your tree roots are, are going to be. And that's without having to dig in and, and, and soil probes, um, you could, uh, you'll know where the tree roots, roots are just by that. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So um, to kind of continue on those lines here. How do we, how do we irrigate this stuff? So uh, Grass typically is spray. Um, spray is inefficient. Using spray in a xeriscape, I have seen it done before. I've got a, a friend here in Vegas who's done it and it's worked out extraordinarily well for him. Um, but drip irrigation is also a great solution. Either emitter line or a, a point source. Point source takes a little bit more work. Emitter line's a little easier. But the goal here is to cover uh, at least 70% of the tree root zone. 100% would be ideal. And you can see in this diagram below on the left, the, the zone to irrigate is, is about the canopy and out. Um, that's where the feeder roots typically are going to be. So that's, that's where we want to irrigate. And if we're looking at a, the bird's eye view, uh, that diagram on the right, you can see the green areas looking down on the tree. The root zone extends out beyond that. And the circle, that's the area that um, that's the area we want to irrigate. And that's lesson number two um, in this is uh, apply the right amount of water to the right area. Um, and here's just a couple diagrams of how you could do this with the emitter line with total CV. You could do rings like this diagram on the right. Now, of course, you with a large tree, you probably have dozens of rings. Um, or you could do a grid like you see on the left, both ways are acceptable. Both are, are easily done with a, a, our, our total CV and power lock fittings, makes it very simple to do. Um, and you could come back after that and top dress it with a, a, either an organic or aggregate mulch. Yeah, I love the uh, tree rings for a couple reasons. One, it's a great way to water your trees, right? This is a, a great way to get the health, healthiest, most best looking uh, trees you'll have. Uh, two, as the tree gets bigger, it's easy to make that ring grow, right? You can flip that inner one out and create another one on the outside. Yep. And uh, for those of you that are in the contracting business, this is great reoccurring revenue. This is a every couple of year uh, opportunity to come back and, uh, and, and make sure the trees are getting the proper irrigation. Yeah, that's, there's another uh, webinar we did. Gosh, Richard, this may have been about a year ago, maybe August, uh, July, August of last year. I think it was titled, How Do I Irrigate That? And we talked about that specific thing, expanding the, 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 the irrigation as the tree grows, to drip irrigation specifically to meet the tree's 
um, the growth needs. So very good point. So um, just a, just a summary here, and I've got I've got a couple other pictures I wanted to share after this, but just a, a summary of everything we've talked about up to this point. So. Um, if you're going to do a turf conversion process, I definitely recommend deeply irrigating your trees before and during if needed. So you get, you get the tree as happy as, as possible, as healthy as possible. You want to identify and protect your major roots that are near the surface. Um, keep that root removal at a minimum. Think of, of root removal like pruning. A large tree, you never want to remove more than one third of the tree canopy. Same thing applies for roots, maybe even less, especially if you're going to do a conversion because you're really going to um, disrupt that, that environment it's growing in. Um, don't trench under the canopy so you're, we're not cutting out those larger stabilizing buttress roots. Um, and if you absolutely have to go under a large root, tunnel under it rather than cutting the root. Um, removing the turf in the root zone, do it carefully. I recommend a selective herbicide and then scalp with a lawnmower. Uh, avoid the heavy equipment and the turf cutters because as we saw, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're removing roots. And uh, in, in cases where you might be doing, you know, large, large equipment is coming in, you have to have these tractors and trucks come in, set up a barricade around the tree root zone that you want to protect to keep the, the, the compaction of soils down as well. Compacted soils will kill tree roots as, as well. And this is a practice that anybody who's ever done a landscape renovation, um, you see this in California with these heritage oak, tree, oak trees or valuable trees, they will set up a, a barricade to keep that heavy equipment out. And then the fifth and, and, and most important, water the tree to survive. Four drip emitters placed at the trunk of the tree aren't gonna help a brand new tree live, let alone a mature tree that's used to growing in, in turf. Um, so at a minimum, 70% um, of that root zone, um, irrigate to that, so. Okay, Andy, we got a bunch of questions now. You have right, some, uh, some interest, which is great. So uh, one, one person's asking, one of our viewers is asking, uh, okay, I pulled the turf out from under the tree. What goes back in there? What are people planting uh, under the trees in Vegas, right? Uh, it's a shady area now. It's, uh, uh, what, what have you seen? What's been your experience? So in, in Vegas, the, the rule is if you're removing turf, you have to have a plant canopy coverage. I, want, uh, I forget the number. I want to say it's 60, 70%, but there, there's a minimum plant canopy coverage. And so it, when, when you go through this process, they'll tell you, you have to come up with a plan and they look at the plant material, make sure it covers that, 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 that minimum canopy coverage. It is possible the tree alone will meet the cat plant canopy coverage. So you could come back, irrigate, just the tree and not need to put plants back in. Um, decorative rock and boulders could be a, a nice solution. But yeah, if you are coming at back and planting things under the canopy and it's, it's a shady area, um, you can uh, you need to go with something that's a little bit more adapted to the shade. When you get outside of the canopy, but still in the tree root zone area where you're getting more sun, we see a lot of uh, Texas shade, uh, Texas sage, uh, the Texas Ranger, they're called. They, they flower in lots of different colors. They're beautiful. You see some Alberta uh, of, of paradise and reds and yellows that are stunning. Lantana. There's a lot of very colorful um, blooming plant material that are desert adapted. So you get uh, you get both the, the the greenery and shade of the uh, of, of the old shade tree, but you get some color mixed in as well. Some summer blooming in it. It really can look stunning, and it's really. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of options. I, my recommendation is go with something that is bright in color uh, because that contrast is nice, but also low water use. Uh, you don't want to get in a scenario where you remove your grass and you come back in with very dense, very high water use plant material and you completely defeat the purpose of uh, removing the turf in the first place. Yeah. And uh, one of our uh, favorite irrigators in Vegas got uh, back to us as Tom Raiden said 50% is the canopy coverage number is what uh, what he's using there in Vegas. Well, Tom, I was hoping you were listening. I knew I knew you or uh, or someone else would chime in with that. Thank you. Well, and another person's asking Andy, uh, how do I irrigate these trees if they're surrounded with uh, artificial turf, and I don't want to damage the artificial turf? Uh, and and I'm guessing the damaging the artificial turf would be pulling it up to install drip line underneath. 
Yeah, well, if, if you are planting a tree in artificial turf, you hopefully installed adequate irrigation ahead of time. If you're putting artificial turf in to replace real turf, you can, you can still put that drip irrigation in ahead of time. If you are in a scenario where, you know, uh, a contractor didn't do it right and he, he put, he didn't put enough, uh, uh, an adequate amount of irrigation into the tree. Um, the, the good thing is that artificial turf, I think you can, you, it's just stapled down. You ought to be able to remove it and reinstall it to, uh, to put adequate irrigation um, to the tree. I will say this about artificial turf and I have my apologies to those in the artificial turf industry. Um, it might look good, but it is a heat sink. And especially around trees, if you were to put that over the tree root zone, that artificial turf is going to do nothing but absorb heat all day long. So you go from a soil that used to be happy, maybe you know, 75, 80 degrees, I'm guessing, to now it's 150 degrees because that artificial turf is a heat sink. It might not be the right solution around shade trees if you're looking to protect the shade trees. Um, maybe that's better used in uh, some of these islands or areas where you, you don't uh, you don't have to worry about that as much so that's my, my opinion but uh, for what it's worth a uh, good, good thing to keep in mind artificial turf is a heat sink and it, it's like asphalt uh, it just happens to be green now with you Andy I spent a lot of time making sure the uh, uh, microorganisms in my soil are the right ones and they're healthy and they're thriving and gosh when I heat them up to 170 200 degrees uh, they're, they're not going to survive very well so yeah, when good, I was in uh, college, uh, good, we came good. down to UNLV, the Sam Boyd Stadium. Uh, they had artificial turf. I don't know what they have out there now. At the time, they had artificial turf. In the middle of the summer, we, we, we measured at like 185 degrees surface temperature. And it was no wonder the players were getting blisters on their feet. They had, they had to water the artificial turf just to cool it down so the players could practice on it. Defeats the purpose. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so true. So another question here is talking about uh, trees on finger islands and parking lots, mm -hmm. right? Uh, um, right, tree coffins, right? And I didn't coin that phrase, that's been out there, but uh, we know this is a tough place to grow a tree. Is there any secret uh, magic potion to putting, uh, uh, to irrigating those trees? Uh, yeah, I, I still think inline drip irrigation is the best way to go because what you want to do is, is as the problem is you have such a small area for those roots to go in and it's like keeping a tree in a landscape container um, too long it just it can't reach its full potential but that soil that is there you want to make sure it's as healthy as possible and irrigate as much of that as possible so um, I, I found the easiest way to do that is um, inline uh, emitter line um, total cv that, that, uh, that, that gives your tree the best fighting chance. Um, if, if you're a designer, design those islands bigger. Uh, Bioswell is a great way to do it. Design them bigger. Um, and uh, boy, who doesn't love parking in the shade on a hot summer day? Last Saturday, it was 117 degrees, I think was the high here in Henderson. I was running errands. I parked in a parking lot. These trees were the canopy coverage was dismal, about the size you'd expect from a 24 inch box tree. Of course, these things never grew, but people were fighting to park in just that little sliver of shade just to keep their car a little bit cooler as they ran in the store. So, um, boy, if we had bigger view designers out there, if we had larger areas and the trees were able to grow bigger, get a bigger canopy, uh, keep our cars cooler, but it reduces the, the heat island effect as well that I think is, is causing a lot of uh, issues in our cities. Andy, somebody else is asking if you have a, uh, you know, kind of a general rule of thumb of uh, how much water to give a mature tree. Oh, uh, okay. I'm going to quote Bob Morris, who's one of the smarter horticulturists in Las Vegas. Um, he he uh, used to run a, a blog called Extreme Horticulture. And I remember him saying for a mulberry, which was uh, a high water use tree, mature size, 30 to 40, 30 gallons probably three times a week was you know, peak ET was going to be. Now, you have to make sure you're putting that in the root zone. It can't be in one spot and go straight down. You got to spread it out. He thought he, he, he thought at least 30 gallons three times a week was going to be was going to be right for that tree. So um, the, the, the more um, 
we could do a webinar just on that topic alone. Maybe that's the next webinar topic. We could spend 30 minutes discussing that question. Yeah, and it is. I mean, it's um, uh, there's a lot of variables too there, right? Where's yeah. the tree? What what time of year, right? There is, right? I think the uh, easiest answer, Andy, is to just get a smart controller and have it calculate it for you. I was just going to say, you know, you I, I, we could spend 30 <laughs> minutes going through what kind of soil you have, how deep are the roots, what's the ET value, what's the what's the crop coefficient, da 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 da. Put in a smart controller, let it do all those, you know, ET Water's got a great solution. Uh, and uh, not only will it, it, it uh, um, do it based on today's weather, it's looking at tomorrow's weather and forecasting as well. And so that's the, the only one in the market doing that, which is a nice little feature. Yeah, and then we've got another question here, Andy, and it's really uh, um, uh, very time specific. We've got counties or cities in Northern California who have uh, made it um, uh, illegal right now to do any automated watering due to the uh, drought. So people want to know, look, I want to protect my asset, you know, the trees. How can I do this now without the automated watering? Do you have any suggestions for them? Absolutely. Go to your nearest uh, distributor um, or to our uh, online web store, buy some rolls of Total CV and some power lock fittings um, and create rings or grids around your tree. And that way you can manually irrigate, depending on your climate, it could be every five, seven, 10, 14 days. Um, and if you have any questions on that, I'll have my contact information up here in a moment. You can contact me via email or cell and I'll gladly help you figure that out. Uh, we saw this in 2015, 2016, the, the drought. I remember when Lake Oroville was down to empty before it was, the spillway was gonna be eroded because it was overflowing, right? It's just, it's this cycle of, of drought but uh, there were a lot of, this was back when brown is the new green. We saw a lot of people doing that with our total CV um, and power lock fittings, these, these uh, tree kits. Uh, and, right, we, uh, yeah. we even have that power lock that screws right on the end of the hose. Yep, yeah, you can hook it and, right up. Uh, yep. And don't water the grass, don't water the flowers, don't water the shrubs, but that twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 shade tree, um, that's that you know that could be worth keeping alive um you know let's you know forego the car wash put that water into your your uh, your tree you'll 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 be glad you did yeah okay andy we've got a few more but i'll let you finish up here okay so here we go this is the picture i showed at the beginning saint rose de lima hospital you can tell they're during they're doing the turf conversion now even though they cut up a bunch of the feeder roots um they they came back and they irrigated sufficiently and what we see this is this is what it looks like today and there's they kept a little bit of that turf in there and it's, it's kind of a, an odd odd little thing but the irrigation after the fact was adequate now what i don't show in this picture is there is a little bit of dieback in the trees and the trees aren't as healthy as they were before but they are alive and they are adapting this is um this is four years later i took this picture uh basically today so four years and, and you know four months later, we still uh, the trees are still alive. Um, a little bit of dieback, uh, but they're they're adjusting and they're adapting. So when it comes to as important as protecting the tree roots are, the real death knell is is inadequate water. So it's like uh, you know if if I if I if if I get sick with a uh, with one disease and then I catch another disease on top of that, right? It's it's that one two punch. That's what does me in. Um, keep the roots, uh, your, your roots may be damaged, but if the water is adequate, you have a fighting chance. If the water is not adequate, that, that becomes a death knell. So in order of priority, um, you know, water becomes, uh, becomes critical to this. And this is, and this is a uh, uh, case in point there. So it, it, uh, turf conversion is doable. You can, you can preserve your shade trees and you can reduce your water bill and uh, have the best uh, of really of both worlds. And um, that's all I got. It's really cool to see that before and after uh, picture, Andy. Thank you, you've had a couple in there. Uh, that's good foresight and uh, planning, thank you. Uh, one last question, uh, Andy, uh, from one of our viewers, and he's asking about, uh, actually two people are asking about this. They're talking about bubblers and tr deep tree wells versus drip irrigation. Is it just as good, better, not as good? What, what do you think on that? Yeah, so if you if you 
planted your tree initially and you did a, a tree well with deep bubblers, that's where the roots are going to be growing. Um, and and that, that works great. If you, if, if the tree was used to grow in a very wide, very shallow turf area, and then you switch it to a deep and narrow bubbler, uh, the, the roots aren't there, right? So it's, the tree is going to decline. So if you started off brand new with the tree planted and it's got the tree well, the bubbler and deep, that, that works. We see this in, in orchards, it works very well. But if you're trying to uh, retrofit it that way, it's not gonna work. The best thing to do is, what's the best way to mimic the water the tree's used to receiving and then, and then work with it from there. Yeah, great suggestions, Andy. You did such a good job. Uh, really appreciate your time and all this information. Uh, very exciting to learn about irrigation and trees and uh, I always learn something new when you're on. So uh, th thanks very much. And I uh, wanna thank all our viewers out there. Uh, great questions today. I love to see that. Uh, really appreciate your attentiveness and, uh, and your input too. So thank you. Without you, you know, this wouldn't be, uh, uh, we wouldn't be on. So we really appreciate that. So uh, again, thanks to everybody. Thank you to, um, uh, to Andy. And uh, we're going to be uh, dark for the next couple of weeks uh, due to Fourth of July holiday. But remember, you can watch all of our trainings uh, at uh, janesusa.com forward slash trainings. They're also uh, wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Uh, we're on there too: Spotify, Google, Apple, iHeartRadio. You can find us there. Uh, enjoy them uh, while you're driving job to job. So again, thank you, Andy. Everybody have a great weekend, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks. Oh, thanks, guys.